So, uh, funny story, I was just, you know, taking a stroll through the Pizzaplex as one Glamrock animatronic who is not a Sonic character does, and I tripped and fell, and, and I fell, and, and, and now I'm here. Been walking for a while, and, and I don't really see anyone... Wait, who is... Wait a minute, there's only one place where the uniform looks like that, the back rooms. If you're not careful and no clip out of reality in the wrong areas, you'll end up here, where it's nothing but the stink of old moist car Carpet, the madness of mono yellow, the endless background noise of fluorescent lights at maximum humbuzz, and approximately 600 million square miles of randomly segmented empty rooms to be trapped in. God save you if you hear something wandering around nearby, because it sure as hell has heard you. And God hopes it hasn't seen what the internet's done to it, too. Yeah, the back rooms is certainly a topic done to death by now in both story and game form. There are plenty of fan-made experiences published on a variety of platforms from itch.io and Steam all the way to Roblox, where it's perhaps the most rampant and predatory. Out of all these, it's commonly accepted which seem to be the best, but can we so confidently agree on which are truly the worst? During a random bout of curiosity, I took to searching back rooms on Steam, resulting in a decently sized list of games, 305 in total. Of these, not many were actually out or even appeared to still be in development. Within the 300 or so similar looking games, some not even backrooms related, I spotted a smattering with mixed or negative reviews and became interested in why they had earned them. What about their interpretation of stinky carpet land was particularly worse than all the others? The backrooms seemed like a relatively free game concept. Make a maze, maybe add monsters, add irritating ambiance, maybe do that a few more times and call it there. Heck, half the monsters and environments you can use have already been made for you. But clearly some people used them badly, so let's satisfy our interest with some hand picked games and see just how you could convert the back rooms into the give me my money back rooms. The first game we will be looking at today is Backrooms 8 Levels, developed by Performance Artist. Off the bat, just looking at the game's trailer, it actually looks like it could be good. And at a price tag of a dollar, and even marked down to 50 cents on sale, I really couldn't go in too upset with it. Still, I wanted to see why such a nice looking game had questionable reviews, so in I went. When booting into 8 Levels, you're greeted with an almost identical loading screen to escape the backrooms. This game has random backgrounds for whenever you're loading that don't necessarily correlate to the level you're traveling to. I think maybe it'd make more sense for them to match your current destination because them being random opens you up to getting spoiled on the later levels. First, we load into the main menu, where we have the option to start a new game or play from any level we'd like. On starting a new game, you'll find yourself in an office where presumably you work. And presumably you have a lot of deadlines coming up judging by how hard you're breathing. Control-wise, we can jump, move, crouch, and sprint. The jumping is actually weirdly realistic, which feels horrible in a game scenario, but looks cool just on a visual standpoint. The camera shake falls victim to the same critique. There's nothing to do in the main office except head to the bathroom, where we find the remains of last night's office mixer and are assaulted by one last party guest, being defenestrated only to wake up in the familiar backrooms we all know. It's pretty standard from here, with mold smeared on the walls directing us to an exit and a healthy helping of pipe cleaner dudes but when exiting this lobby level, this is where the game starts to shake it up a bit. The next level takes place in the abandoned offices, where there are random bits of furniture lying around, some of which glow with the color blue. Stepping near a blue furniture item will reveal that it is a monster, and said monster will proceed to kill you. So it's kind of like Prop Hunt, except you don't have any defense. This is where I noted an interesting mechanic this game has, a health system. Most backroom games tend to just have the monsters kill you in one hit. However, it takes multiple hits for most monsters in this game to kill you, which is actually refreshing and gives you a chance to recover from a mistake. I think more Backrooms games should do this. And yes, I'm aware that this system only comes from the fact that this game uses a Backrooms template off the Unreal Engine marketplace that costs 90 US dollars. I hope that was worth it, cause damn. But my point stands, it's new to see. Anyway, this and all other levels in the game only require you to find an exit after running around for a while. This time, to escape, we fall through a long tunnel while seemingly hitting our head on every single railing on the way down. This has us waking up 
rapid pipe dreams, a level consisting of a maze of rusty pipes. It was late at night at this point and I was hungry so I summoned my gameplay channel editor, Ruffles, to play this over Parsec while I hunted down the can of Pringles I swear I had left but I couldn't find it and honestly that's the biggest tragedy of my career. Anyway, he decided to play with a corpse instead of going anywhere. Eventually, the both of us stumbled on the exit after running into yet another chenille beast and we ended up getting it stuck on a ramp, granting us safer passage to the next level, icebergs. I will say that I appreciate the developer making an effort to transition into new levels visually with things like the ice on the walls here. The loading screen is still very abrupt though, minor nitpick, but I appreciate a good fade-in effect. Icebergs is actually a level I haven't seen done before either in canon or in a pre-existing Backrooms game. The closest I can find to it are level 288, Icy Frontier, and level 202, Snowy Glacier, but I'm still currently on the fence about that possibly being a joke level because it only has one entity and it's called the, uh, the Goober. <laughs> As a new concept in terms of Backrooms games, I think this level is pretty cool, no pun intended, and it definitely nails the liminal vibe with chilling ambiance and bitter blue lighting over hills that look to run for miles. If I were stuck here, I'd definitely be feeling the dread. The objective here is to run between a bunch of power terminals and turn them on to power an elevator. Because of the frigid temperatures, you can't be out too long in the cold, as you have three minutes before you freeze to death. It's initially a bit hard to tell though because the timer is formatted backwards for some reason. You can reset your timer by going near the campfire strewn throughout the level. As a minor aside, going in the water doesn't affect your timer at all. The water is actually completely solid despite not looking to be frozen. Guess they didn't anticipate the player trying to end their run right after getting into the level. As another minor aside, I know that breathing this much in a cold climate would have your lungs burning after not long at all. If by chance any of my viewers are in icebergs using the last of your phone battery to watch me, one, thank you, remember to subscribe before you freeze, and two, don't breathe so violently. Once you've got the elevator powered, it's on to the pool rooms, a common fan favorite level. In usual form, it's a white tiled serene building with white light streaming from the windows and plenty of slides and fountains to play in. Except 30 minutes of playing later and we still couldn't figure out where to go. It felt like we were going in circles, this couldn't be the end, right? It's called eight levels. I only counted five. Well, it turns out that in order to exit this level, you have to die. Yeah, you have to drown in the water. That is probably the least intuitive thing in the game. Why on earth would I try and die when it's been proven before that that restarts the level? The walls say the water shows the way, but I was interpreting that as follow the water, not, well, you know. One nice lack of oxygen later and we find ourselves in what appear to be sewers. Walking around, we get startled by some monstrous noises, but it turns Turns out they're just rats, or so we thought. Further walking reveals a door that tells us to find the door number. Initially I am confused because isn't it like right there? But no, it apparently means that we need to go and find these separate glowing numbers stationed on the walls around the level and click on them to collect them. It is while doing this that we realize that those noises were not in fact just rats and were instead this scary naked dude who's been hiding around the level disguised as a cloud of bugs. Once we know to avoid the bug cloud though, it's smooth sailing for the most part and we're able to proceed from here onto Kitty's house, or as this game calls it, Kitty House. Turns out that apostrophe S is pretty damn important when differentiating a good kitty and a bad kitty. Loading into Kitty House, we are greeted with a sensory blast of roaring, squealing, and our own frantic breathing as we peel ourselves off the floor in a garish pink hallway. Ahead of us is a set of double doors and writing on the floor telling us to stay in the light. The reason for that and the source of the screaming becoming apparent as soon as the lights shut off and we are greeted with a glowing, is that that one cursed cat? Well, whatever it is, it kills us in one hit, sending us back to the start. Few things to note right away. This is a very weird interpretation of Kitty's house, if that's what it's really meant to be, which it appears to be since it has near identical decoration to the depiction of the level we already know. According to the Backrooms wiki dot, level 974 appears to be a moderately sized home with pink slash cute theming and decor throughout the interior. It holds amenities which have all been proven safe to use and wanderers are encouraged to use them while in the level as they may not encounter counter another safe spot for a while. So far, this matches up to what we see in-game. But then, only one known entity resides in level 974, the entity known as Kitty. Kitty is a 3.2 meter tall humanoid entity with unnaturally long, lanky limbs which lack hands or feet. Kitty has not yet displayed any forms of hostility, opting instead to stalk wanderers as they explore and rest within level 974. However, some sources suggest that Kitty becomes at least slightly aggressive if wanderers overstay their welcome. We don't see this kitty anywhere and the level is anything but safe. Now 
I'm no stickler for canonicity when it comes to the backrooms. In fact, I think in order for a backrooms game to be good, it needs to shake up the meta a bit instead of just sticking to the wiki word by word. A good example of this would be how Escape the Backrooms has begun to handle its levels, often just disregarding canon entirely and simply using the same names as commonly known levels like Level Fun Plus, which in canon, heavy finger quotes there, is just a copy of the original Level Fun except the partygoer entities here are fresh off the set of Despicable Me 2. ETB shakes it up by instead opting to make Fun Plus a harder and larger version of the original Level Fun, giving the existing partygoers new behavior like timed hunt periods and the ability to wander, while also introducing a new mechanic in the form of fireworks you can use to kill the party host entities throughout the level. So why is it that both of these games are changing the meta here, but only one is really doing it well? Well, Escape the Backroom still stays true to the underlying theme of level fun in its interpretation of it. It's still a dangerous level filled with deceptive happy traits. On the contrary, the two interpretations of Kitty's house here don't have much in common besides appearance. I suppose my point overall is it'd probably work better if the level used a different name, because as it stands, it's trying to fill shoes that it doesn't fit and therefore will have trouble standing on its own. That being said, this level is hilarious rather than scary, so I can't be too mad at it. Escaping not kitty by waiting out the dark periods in closets leads us into level exclamation mark or run for your life. But you can't guess the objective here. This one's another fan favorite, a red hall with sirens and entities chasing you at every second. Dodge the obstacles and just keep moving. There's not much this level had to do and it did it well enough. Not much to say here besides the camera movement making making it a bit nauseating. In the end, and I mean that literally, we escape level run and wake up in a hospital bed, presumably post window exit. Was it all a dream? Or is that just false hope? I suppose only time will tell. So what did I think of the backrooms eight levels? Well, it lived up to the title. It's eight backrooms levels. For a dollar, it's honestly decent, but definitely not innovative, given that it came out this January, long after many more influential backrooms experiences have already released. It's not really offensively bad though, it's just a little janky. I had fun playing it, definitely toned down the camera shake and the asthmatic man behind it, and you'd have a nice little experience here. Without further ado, let's look over to the next game on my list. So here we have a little game called Backroom Beyond, developed by White Vortex Games. While eight levels just had mixed reviews, this ones are just straight up negative. And I can't say that I disagree with them, even though I didn't hate the game all that much. According to the Steam page, Backroom Beyond is a first person game that mixes puzzles with platforms in a dark harrowing environment that makes the player question the protagonist's sanity. And maybe also my sanity because nobody forced me to make this video Video. But I digress, this game actually subverted my expectations and rather than trying to be a horror game, it turned out to be a puzzle game that reminded me more of Portal than anything, which I found very interesting. That being said though, it's real long and it takes a while to get interesting, so we aren't gonna do a play-by-play -play of this one because we'd be here all day and I really don't want to see some of these puzzles again. At a price of $5, Backroom Beyond boasts 40 levels. However, these aren't unique Backrooms levels like you might think, instead they're more like a collection of mobile game levels. Each one has you needing to move one or more of these glowing red blocks onto glowing red buttons. You can move them by pushing them, or you can use this shovel you get in every level for some reason. Most reviews seem to really hate the shovel and the noises it makes when hitting a wall. I personally don't find them that bad. This tool is mostly just good for getting blocks off the walls if they manage to get stuck. The game starts simple with you only needing to move the red blocks, but then begins to introduce new aspects to its puzzles as you progress, such as blue blocks that you can use to reach higher places and green blocks that you can pick up and throw. They start introducing those portal vibes later on with red and blue mirrors you can use to teleport around, even including places where you'll need to aim your fall off a platform into one of these mirrors. Every 10 levels or so, you'll get a new environment to solve your puzzles in. Transitioning from the usual mono yellow walls into an abandoned industrial building, into a forest, and then eventually back to the mono yellow again with occasional breaks for spice. The game is not devoid of story, interestingly. As you progress, a mysterious presence will start to try to communicate with you. It first starts doing so in the form of large eyes staring at you from pits and platforms. And stop staring at me with them big old eyes! <laughs> It then moves into speaking directly through a humanoid form that fades out of reach before you can get to it. Each time it speaks, it taunts you, asking you your goals, your vices about your grip on reality, presenting you with what I think is its vision of true loneliness or possibly insanity. And at the end, nearly four hours after your start, you are given a choice. 
up or down, it doesn't really matter. The endings are classified as white and red, and only one gives you an achievement for finding the exit, but they both lead to the same place, and I guarantee you're not guessing where, an entire copyrighted music video. <laughs> yeah, I can't show this. <laughs> Not like it even worked in game anyway. And I try to find and link the song, which was credited as Irregular Pearls by Third Good World, but it doesn't seem to exist. I'm guessing it's some sort of mistranslation. While it's a relatively inoffensive puzzle experience, Backroom Beyond has some core gameplay issues I want to address that made certain puzzles a lot more irritating to complete and are likely to turn away players who aren't as masochistic as I am. One, the red block gets stuck a lot on the edge of the buttons and pushing it off the stuck point can put you at risk of nudging it off a platform when in later levels. Buttons probably shouldn't be elevated off the ground in this case. Two, the green block completely blocks ha, your vision while you're carrying it. You're expected to place the block precisely in some puzzles and in others even platform while carrying it. And this is difficult to do while just making vague guesses as to where the floor is. Advice, make it translucent while being held at least. Three, the shovel tends to just forget you're holding it at random points and will simply float in the air until you left click to make I could remember that it should obey gravity. This is mostly a nuisance when waiting for a platform to come over and holding the shovel in place in preparation to shove a block onto said platform when it gets there, only for the shovel to have entered its god state when it does, therefore not letting you use it. Or, as far as I know, you can't put things down gently without throwing them. It would be a lot more convenient if I could organize a nice little staircase rather than chucking blocks until they just so happen to form something climbable, especially when that's what the game wants. Backroom Beyond is not necessarily a bad game. It's just a very, very boring one. I finished this game during my web development class in the evening because it took that little exclusive brain power. That's how investing it was. It takes far too long to do anything of note besides adding new blocks. I will admit the story did get me intrigued, but it's just too vague to leave me wondering. Nothing really gets explained and the gameplay wasn't gripping enough to make it have staying power. And it took way too long to get to that story because I wasn't getting anything until level 25 or so, and that was about two hours into my playtime. Do I think it deserves all the negative reviews? Well, not if it were cheaper. Five dollars might not be that much, but it's a bit of a tall ask for such a repetitive experience. I'd say it's closer to a two dollar game, and even then it'd probably deserve mixed reviews at the meanest. I think people get more upset when they've gotta sacrifice more to play something that turns out subpar, you know? Okay, that last one was a bit short, but this next one may be the last, but it certainly isn't the least. I don't know if it's the worst on my list, but it's definitely the strangest. Why, it's a little game called Backroom Room 231. At least it's called that in the library, everywhere else they just call it Room 231. It was developed by Genie Games and it costs $3. Let's get one thing out of the way before we dive in. Yeah, this one uses a lot of AI images, even in the library art. I don't like the use of image generators for final game assets. In my opinion, they should only be used as tools, not as shortcuts. For brainstorming, sure, go for it, but don't go using those generated results as actual set pieces. They are uncanny and they are unprofessional. I'm not here to do a deep dive on AI ethics though. I just wanted to get that out of the way before the rest of the game, because we'll be seeing a lot of random AI posters and possibly 3D models throughout the experience, and just for the sake of analyzing the game itself, I'm not going to comment on it much past this point. So get ready for a wild ride as we start up Room 231, picking new game on the main menu, we instantly load into a simple house or apartment with a heavy analog footage filter over our view. I like it, I think it's neat. According to the developer, this is intended to be a recreation of level 231 of the back rooms. First, I walk around trying all the doors. They all seem to be locked. Giving up on that, I'm about to head upstairs when suddenly I'm assaulted by beach balls with the game telling me it's been infected and that my computer is next. I'm trying to avoid getting damage from the balls, trying to head upstairs and wondering, did I download a virus? Is this video Video totally screwed? Is this a scripted event? Am I supposed to be able to- Oh, that's embarrassing. If I had a nickel for every time I got pranked making a horror essay, I'd have two nickels. Which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice. Recovering from my embarrassment, I continue my checks and eventually head up the topmost stairs where the game resets in PT-esque fashion. Trying that same door again yields no results this time around. Instead, we see another door creak open, but it slams before we can get to it. Now, if we try the door on the stairs, we reset. On this reset, routine checks lead me into the kitchen hallway, but on turning 
around, I'm stuck inside and the walls close around me and this little plush toy before another reset is triggered by us falling through the floor. Upstairs is dark now and we can hear the TV turn to static. It's annoying, so I go to fix it and am accosted by this guy. I, uh, I don't know what he's supposed to be. Sure is freaky looking though. The upstairs door resets us again and Blue Dude appears to jump us on the stairs but makes no further move, introducing one key issue the negative reviews have with this game, the cheapness of a lot of the horror. Oftentimes this game will just throw things at you without warning or build up to try and make you jump. Whether or not this is good horror really depends on the player in my opinion. It gets me sometimes, other times not. Though since this is a backrooms related horror game, it would probably work better if horror was a slower build up because that seems to be what people usually expect and want to see in these kinds of games. And it's not like the game doesn't do this well later on, for example, though a bit generic, I like this one moment where you're locked in a corner and something begins trying to wrestle open the door. The game just doesn't start with this stuff and therefore doesn't make a good first impression by going boo every few minutes, which results in people quitting early because they assume that's all they're gonna get. This reset does contain a good moment in these mannequins being present while you search for your next reset point, surrounding you shortly after as you move into the master bedroom and trapping you until you press a switch. I wish the game were clearer about what you need to do here though. While there isn't much you could do while trapped here, it was never explained that this tiny thing that looks like an outlet is actually a switch. Flipping it scares them off and allows you to access the upstairs door for a reset, then a few more resets, then an impromptu house party where everyone gets to look at the results of a drunken Bing image generator session that we were apparently proud enough of to hang on the wall. Such a celebration does not last forever though, as one more reset and everyone's gone, leaving the art alone save for a faint clapping sound, one that we are told to watch out for. I like this segment, it's not too hard to figure out and plays into the classic mimic enemy type. We need to avoid any paintings that are making the clapping sound, which increases in intensity and volume as we get closer to a bad one. Apparently they can move, but if you're fast, it's not too relevant. We need to make it downstairs to flip a painting that unlocks the upstairs door, allowing for a reset. The route's not too bad to figure out, but the jump scare upon dying is really loud, so be warned. This game likes to blow out your ears. A few more minor resets later, and our next task has us finally opening this door here, leading to a bathroom. In here, we must find a series of switches by picking up and moving things around to reveal them. It's at this point that my flashlight died, which made things a bit more annoying given that the developer didn't add any extra batteries lying around and I was not previously made aware that my light was limited. Back to the gamma adjuster. Eventually, we get to reveal that there is a body bag in the tub. This is fine. Let me just squeeze past you there. Don't mind the emotional support towel. And I'm not even gonna question the logistics of this. One more final reset and we end up traveling back to the bathroom and getting locked in where we are then harassed by awful orange lighting and promptly chased down by the big blue dolphin guy again and into a new area, this time based on level 6. A brand new flashlight is waiting for us right at the start. Thank goodness it's more helpful this time around since the place is pitch black. We're able to continue on and wander aimlessly for a while. One of the doors we approach suddenly slams open in our face and our character reacts vocally this time, to my surprise given he never spoke before. <laughs> This triggers valves to appear all around the area, and we must find them all and turn them. Valves that have already been turned are not able to be turned again, so that's one way to check if you hit one already. Do it quickly, your flashlight can still run out of battery here, and there are no spares to be found. Thankfully, the valves glow a bit in the dark, but it's still troublesome to navigate. When all are turned, we can- Hold up, there's something I gotta mention before we continue. The reviews for this game said level 2 was essentially impossible, or at the least, very annoying. But wasn't that pretty easy? Well, maybe in a bugged state it was. At least, I can only conclude that it was bugged because every gameplay video of this level I can find actually features smilers roaming around while you search for valves. I have no idea why I didn't encounter any. I cross-checked the dates of posted gameplay videos with patch notes and nowhere was it mentioned that smilers were removed since then, so perhaps they were all at the dentist. Gotta maintain those pearly whites somehow. I'll take it. I ventured through the now open exit door back into the house from before, greeted with a pentagram with a bottle of almond 
water placed in the center. We need to take the bottle into the kitchen and place it on another pentagram to unlock the first proper level of the game, Winding Road. After this point, the house we started in acts as a sort of level select as we progress, which is interesting. Arriving in Winding Road, we're told to focus on any sounds we hear and determine the direction they're coming from, as well as only move one step at a time. Unfortunately, this sign can't stop me because I can't read. Alright, so what's the deal here? The key is to take that note seriously and only move one step at a time, as the floor blocks will light up to indicate your progress. Every step, you're supposed to listen closely to determine where the dolphin's mumbling is coming from, and take a step away from it, gradually getting closer to the door. Problem is, the directional sound here is not amazing, so it's pretty annoying to actually figure out where to step, and every time you mess up, you have to sit through a 30 second death sequence. Very tiring. I ended up just looking at a video to get the combo down and then counting out loud as I stopped. Be careful though, halfway through the dolphin guy starts constantly approaching, so you need to step quickly while still listening. Not really very fair, I don't think, given that the mumbling is so hard to hear without a stressor on your back. But yeah, here's the code for you fellow Room 231 sufferers. When you reach the hallway ahead of you, turn right, not left. Be aware Dolphin Man is still going to be chasing you here, although if you do go left, he gets a bit confused. The door will close behind you as you enter this new area, based on level 34, and Dolphin Guy will no longer chase you, but he is replaced by this guy, who will constantly chant about how he wants to tear you apart in the funniest way possible. Squeeze the throat. Smash the face. Yes. It's about time you showed up. Time for you to die. Even better, if he catches you, he basically just steals your camera and runs away like a giddy toddler. I love him. To avoid capture, we can hide in these tunnels by crouching. Careful not to sit too close to the entrance. To escape, we need to input a code into a panel at the end of a hall. The code is written above, but in the form 7BDB, meaning you have to translate it out of its cipher form. I'm sorry, but I'm definitely missing something obvious here, since I'm not really understanding how, but the code translates to 7236. The exit door opens within one one of the tunnels, leading you back to the main house. Our object of interest this time is a radio we must place on a pentagram upstairs to access the new level Lost and Found. It's a maze this time, much larger and much more confusing than previous ones, but at least we get some batteries for our flashlight this time. Scrawled on the wall is the message keep your eyes on the blue, with the blue soon being revealed to be this jerk again, who does indeed move closer while you're not looking at him, and he can pass through walls as well. I'm embarrassed to admit that this monster is actually actually finally somewhat unsettling when used in this context. At least he's pretty slow, but careful not to get caught in any small rooms or you'll have to do some master weaving to avoid him. And also, there's some kind of rat monsters in here too? If you encounter one, don't bother with the room it's in, you don't need to pass through it. Be purposeful with opening doors, try not to open too many random ones, you'll see why in a second. At the start of a maze, you get a map. I was terrible at using it, but it does lead you to landmark rooms with furniture that are marked, and then to a keypad with the code 4386, indicated probably by the colors above this locker, but it's unclear as to how. It's now that that path you carved before comes into play. Dolphin Man's dad shows up and he's none too happy with how you've been dodging his son's affections. Avoid the porpoise patriarch to reach the house again, where it's dark now. We can go to a new switch on the wall to turn on the lights and get jump scared by a painting. Terrifying. The book's supposed to go on a pentagram upstairs on a shelf, and this time we unlock classic horror story, which spawns spawns us in an attic where we should really be wearing a mask when presented with all of this asbestos. This place is apparently based on level 19, but I don't see the resemblance. From this point forward, footage has been captured from the channel Holy Horrific Horror Show, as I was not able to beat the maze. The ladder from Metal Gear is here, and it leads us to a floor where we can find a key in a room that opens a nearby door. A bit pointless to have it locked, if you ask me, and past that door is a room with a camera and a battery for it. As soon as you put in the battery, the lights go out starting up an ambiance on par with a malfunctioning hearing aid. From this point on, we have to use the night vision on the camera to see, ending with us getting stuck in this room after turning a painting and needing yet another keypad code. Once again, I do not understand this puzzle. The code is 2538. It lets us escape the room and grab a valve before being confronted with Dolphin Man's many cousins whom we must avoid by weaving through the darkness. Put the valve on the knob in the starting area to extend a pole allowing for us to jump into another room containing a paper and another camera battery. 
battery. Then dig around the insulation in the main area for a bit to find another key. It's hidden behind a brick pole hinted at by the paper and is accessible by crouching. It unlocks a cabinet on the same floor containing a VHS tape that you can play in the VCR where you found the paper. But on your way back out, you'll see a shiny key on the floor. Looks too handy to be a good idea. Yeah, that seems about right. Now once the tip of hide in the darkness really comes into play. The blue goo dudes won't chase you while you do it. You don't get much information out of watching the VHS, but it does give you a paper that, when grabbed, instantly transports you to a flowery hallway where you get jump scared again and can then leave. R riveting. When you exit, a new key is waiting for you, unlocking a cabinet with a valve that you can finally take back to the second knob. It extends a third pole over the pit, use it to access a room with a long, narrow plank with another key at the end, and yet another blue dolphin that immediately goes on the hunt. Running from this one is all you can do. Back down the ladder to hurriedly unlock the first door and with that, the last key to escape the longest level in the game. Back at home once again, we have a VCR now, and we need to place it on the table with the television to unlock the level dreaming through the bathroom door. We now find ourselves in a quaint house with a firearm on the table and a door ahead that leads out to an admittedly very pretty road at night lit with these glowing balloons. This is a cool set piece. It's a bit weird, but maybe I'm just a sucker for city lights. This place is apparently based on level 69. Nice. Anyway, there's a freaky thing in the sky, so we need to be in a hurry. We need to find four switches and flip them. You can see the next switch's location by checking the computer at the starting location, but it's best if you just have a guide in the interest of the time limit. One's over here by some trees, one's in a lint house, one's in a maze on the wall, and one's on the ground at a far corner of the map. Avoid these crab things while doing so. Don't worry, they're extremely slow. The changing color of the sky indicates the time you have left to find the switches. Once you have them flipped, head back to the main house and take note of the order of the colored blocks. You'll likely end up dying and resetting due to time, but the code does not change, so this time, grab your firearm and head outside to shoot balloons of the same colors you noticed before, yellow, blue, green, and red, and watch the notes on the wall until they reveal the code to you. Lastly, head to a house on the far end of the map connected to a road and enter the code on the attached keypad to be done with what's probably the most confusing level of the game. Horror Show mentions they were stuck here for hours. I think one easy way of fixing this would be to get rid of the time limit since there's no point to it and it just makes it unclear to players whether or not the code randomizes on every death, resulting in people going back to the switches when they don't need to and wasting time. It's time for another home visit, this time to place a bowl in the kitchen and unlock the floor is water. Sounds a lot less threatening than the usual. Actually, never mind, something's in the water. Awesome. Our goal here is to find 12 books and place them on a shelf near the start. The monster here is invisible, but you can hear it splashing, and it will affect the book's locations if it hits one that's on the ground. Use that to determine where it is. Furniture is placed around to provide an occasional safe space out of the water. Some books are located upstairs too, but there's no water here at least. I'd say this is the best level in the game. It's well lit, requires no limited resources, and is clear about its threats. Dying is entirely your fault here, and to its credit, its monster is better used than poor ruined Monty. Okay, one last home visit. No items to place this time, and all the previous ones are gone. Maybe they got eaten by our new absolutely massive plush bunny. Said bunny also trailed something all over the house, leading us to the bathroom where four paintings debate. Three are lying and one is telling the truth, each holding a paper with a code. The right code is 1324, I think. You can now leave the room to place the final item down on the final pentagram, letting you out of the house and into a forest. Walking aimlessly, we find a person with a car who seems to be stranded. But before we can converse, it's revealed we're still trapped in this strange hell. And boss music begins as we are given a new firearm and a note telling us to, you know what, never mind. You've got to head to mirrors scattered through the forest and shoot them. I think their locations are indicated by the blue lights in the sky. The whole time, you'll be hunted by a large green dolphin thing, which is unaffected by bullets. After getting them all, make your way to the huge exit sign in the sky to enter a TV studio and exit through the door to the right to reveal the true nature of our story. It's the Truman Show! But if Truman were being experimented on, on escaping the studio, we're shot, our memory is wiped, and we're carted off to test out what I assume is gonna be room 232. Well, that sucks. And here I thought the Backrooms Workers Union was doing something. To be fair to this game, I think it was definitely trying, and the concept of there being multiple clusters of backrooms is cool. It also trying to develop its own backrooms levels is also nice to see, but it uses too many forced jump scares to be as cool as it could be. The real fatal flaw of this game, though, is its difficulty. It's long, but it doesn't take long to start ramping up the challenge. And the challenge isn't a good challenge, it's the kind that comes from nobody knowing what 
what the heck to do because the puzzles are too convoluted, and eventually giving up to go play something better after a lot of trial and error. Even watching videos, I couldn't tell why some of the codes were what they were. There's definitely a lot here for $3 though, and the developer seems to actively be fixing issues with it still, so I can tell this was made out of passion. That's good, keep doing that, and like I always say, you'll improve. The game's on sale for $2 as I make this video, but I think it'd be funny if you sold it for $2.31, because you know, it's the name of the game, and whoa, geez, was not expecting that last one to be so long. I went into this like, oh, cheeky little backrooms games, let's check them out, then got into like 12 hours of cumulative gameplay, yeesh. But I was kind of determined to finish this video because I already scrapped the last idea I had, and I was behind schedule, which my workaholic brain says is unacceptable. But here you go, a long bit of backrooms goodness to scratch that weekend brain itch. I hope you enjoyed, and if you did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and drop a like. I'm gonna go take a heck of a nap, but before I do, don't forget that this has been Glamrock Dusky, and have a fazerific day!